Welcome to the world, according to Mike Graham. This is, of course, Talk TV. And over the next half an hour, we're going to be looking at all manner of weird and wonderful things, including the strange world of Jeremy Corbyn in my deep dive. Jeremy Corbyn became an MP in 1983. Now, most people would dress up for their first day at work, but not Jezza. Here he is wearing a scruffy jumper knitted by his mum. Is uh, that the jumper that your mum made? Yes, it is. She didn't make the shirt as well, I suppose. No, no, she didn't make the shirt. That came from the co-op. As Labour MP for Islington North, Jezza discovered early on that if there's one thing he hates, it's the Tories, especially fat Tories. There's fleets of limousines draw up and out get large Tory MPs with even larger stomachs wearing dinner jackets and they stride in to vote. A proud socialist, Jeremy has never been shy of sharing his left-wing views, even when no one wants to hear them. Since you're getting so excited and so agitated, I will, I don't be so abusive. The best thing to have happened to the environment was the fall of the Berlin Wall, so that property rights began to reverse the ecological catastrophe that Marxism had created. After becoming Labour leader in 2015, Jeremy was given the very best media training and always knew exactly where the cameras were. Jeremy, look at the cameras, please. Thank you, cameras right down here. Thank, Thank you. you very much for coming here today. No one tells Jezza what to say, except when they write it on the auto cue and he reads it out by mistake. We need to be investing in skills, investing in our young people. And, strong message here, not cutting student numbers. And much like his former girlfriend, Diane Abbott, Jeremy has always had a great head for numbers. Some even call him the human calculator. So how much will it cost? I'll give you the figure in a moment. You don't know it? Um, can I give you the exact figure in a moment? Is this not exactly the issue? All of our manifesto is, um, is fully costed and examined. And, but uh, you're holding a manifesto, you're flicking through it, you've got an iPad there, you've had a phone call while we are in here, and you, you, you don't know how much it's going to cost. Jeremy is a perfect specimen of man, and there's nothing he can't do, except play football against an eight-year-old boy. Now that's tricky. But with Jeremy in charge of the Labour Party, there was much to celebrate. And he couldn't resist giving Shadow Foreign Secretary Emily Thornberry a high five. Shame he missed. <laughs> but if you think Jez is weird, wait until you meet his brother Piers. <laughs> and that brings us bang up to date. Jeremy may be gone. But his fans have not. Can the Labour Party ever distance themselves from the cult of Corbynism? That was my deep dive into Jeremy Corbyn. Now let's meet an expert. And I'm delighted to say I'm joined by Simon Danchuk, former Labour MP. Simon, welcome to the world according to Mike Graham. Um, you might or might not be a, the, the biggest expert or the greatest expert on Jeremy Corbyn. Um, but you know him, you've worked okay. with him, you were an MP. I mean, I was quite surprised to see that he's been an MP now for 40 years. Yeah, That's incredible. a pretty long time. Yeah. And I was going to suggest it might be called, if you were to do a, an autobiography of him, 40 Years of Solitude. Because he doesn't seem to have a lot of mates, really, does he? No, that's that's a fair comment, actually. And But people put up with him for a heck of a long time, mm. didn't they? Tony Blair put up with him yeah. throughout the Blair years. Yes. And, and then he, he wandered. He hit the jackpot when Ed Miliband became leader. Yes. And unfortunately for me, I'm traditional Labour. Yeah. So I get elected in 2010. Right. You have uh, Gordon Brown stands down as leader because yes. he's lost the election. Ed Miliband becomes leader. Mm. Uh, I'd supported David, so that yeah. wasn't a good start. Oops. Yeah. Uh, Ed is on the soft left, the yeah. North. London Labour, yeah. he then fixes it so that whoever his predecessor is has this opportunity to recruit loads of people cheaply to yeah. the party right. uh, and to Jeremy Corbyn. Mm. So from my perspective, it goes from Ed Miliband, which yeah. is bad enough, to doubly bad uh, Jeremy, Jeremy Corbyn. Corbyn. Yeah, well, I mean, he's not a trade unionist and he's not a working class person no. either, is he? No. I, I mean, the reality is that he's very middle class and this was part of the problem mm. for the Labour Party, yeah. uh, particularly, and, and for me individually, because yeah. I'm from a very working class background yeah. uh, in Burnley in Lancashire. He can't re relate to people in the red wall sense, no. as it were. He's very awkward with people as well, isn't he? I mean, yeah. when you see him with people, do you remember that incident on the train? 
um, which may or may not have turned out to be him spinning the truth. But he was sitting, do you remember, in a, in a corridor yeah, or, yeah. or outside a toilet on a train. Yeah. And people were going, well, hang on, there were some seats. Well, you know, yeah, what are you doing? Yeah. You know, he's just spinning this. But he, get, he gives the impression of a guy who's sort of permanently on the edge of anger. Uh, I used to watch him with some mirth coming out yeah. of his house. Always surprised there was a photographer there. But he shouldn't have been because he was the leader of the Labour Party. And he would jump in the, in the car and slam the door so hard. You were thinking, I hope you don't catch your fingers in It there, could be quite tetchy, actually, yeah. quite grumpy, actually. Mm. I, I once had a one-to-one -one with him. I'd right. been critical of his uh, leadership style. Right. Uh, the Financial Times described me as Corbyn's fiercest critic. Oh, yeah. Uh, he didn't take well to this. <laughs> and, he, and when he was leader... and What I'm, sort of I'm, time would this be? What this sort of would year? be 2015, I okay. think. Yeah, right. late 2015. He invites me into a meeting... Uh, one-to-one -one in his yeah. office and it's all quite pleasant uh, but what struck me a couple of yeah it, what really struck me is that he hadn't moved on from his sort of teenage mm. years yeah so he'd got he'd formed these political views in his teenage years as we often do yes uh, but it stuck to them uh, completely right and the other thing that struck me was that he's not overly intelligent. I'm being genuinely honest about this. Listen, I, I think there's a great thing to be said for the truth in these matters, you know, because I've met an awful lot of MPs and many of them, I would say, are not imbued with a great amount of common sense. No. And many of them have got no kind of real understanding of the, of the world outside of their little, you know, enclave in which they live. Yeah. And, you know, ordinary people just don't relate to them, Yeah, do that's they? right. And some of them aren't very bright. Yeah, that's right. I, and I've met Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, David Cameron. Yeah. It's not a party political issue, no. uh, David Miliband. And you you come away thinking, wow, they just get straight to the mm. point. They, they're smart. Yeah. And I came out with, from the meeting with Jeremy Corbyn thinking exactly the opposite. Just well, not a smart his academic guy. record would back that up. He's only got two A-levels. Uh, they were E-grade, I'm afraid. So uh, yeah. Even though he's in. privately educated, I think. Yeah, so, well, he yeah. was, yeah, for certain some part of his life. He certainly did go to a prep school. Yeah. But, you know, the other thing that I'd noticed about him is that he really resented any kind of criticism. He just couldn't take it, could he? No. He wasn't keen. But Keir Starmer hasn't dealt with him very well either because, I mean, while apparently the Labour uh, sort of rules say that you can't kick him out of the Labour Party, but he can kick him out of the Parliamentary Party, he yeah. still sits in the House of Commons as an independent MP. You know, this next election might be sort of do or, or do or dare for him because yeah. if he stands as an independent will he win do you think uh, no, I, I don't think he will. I mean, North London, Islington, where he would stand, is not my sort of territory, right. so I'm not an expert. I'm on, not keen on Islington uh, myself. Uh, on, on that. But, uh, but I, I, I'd be very surprised. He, uh, the other interesting thing is, would he stand for Mayor of London? I mean, he could give Sadiq Khan a real run for his... I suppose so. I mean, I'm one of those people who can't understand how Sadiq Khan keeps getting re-elected. Mm. I, I mean, he must have some remarkable election agents because it just doesn't... I mean, particularly now, I think yeah. he's, he's at his most vulnerable, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah, that's um, right. It could at least Corbyn could at least split the vote. Mm. I mean, it's interesting because uh, Sadiq Khan nominated Corbyn to be uh, in with a chance of becoming Labour leader. Right. So he needed so many nominations from the parliamentary Labour Party: yes. uh, Margaret Beckett, Sadiq Khan, because he was going for yeah. mayor of London. The selection of mayor right. of London, he, he wanted to be seen to be supporting the left. So they they, they are culpable in all of this. Yeah. Actually, they they helped to put Corbyn well, in place. I mean, they managed to get him into place and then almost destroyed the Labour Party, didn't they? Because yeah, yeah. Corbyn had the most horrific um, election defeat yeah. um, against the uh, uh, against the Tory Party, yeah. and it was just awful. I mean, it was I think it was the worst election defeat since the 1930s, wasn't it? Yeah, and not surprising. I, yeah. mean, I mean, you had this cabal of uh, far left activists running the party. Yeah. I mean, it's just disastrous. Nuts, as I call them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's a good yeah. description. Yeah, I mean, what about his liking for poetry? I didn't know this, but apparently he's got a book coming out. It, make, make sure you put your orders in early for Christmas because he's got a book coming out uh, called Poetry for the Many. Um, he's co-authored it. It's more of a, a sort of compendium of other people's poetry with Len McCluskey, uh, yeah. the trade union firebrand. I mean, it doesn't strike me that they're two men that would be particularly sensitive to... Um, Romantic poetry of the Victorian era. No, all very bizarre, yeah. really. And uh, I, I don't know if there's any words worth in there. Yeah. Perhaps I'll buy it for people I don't get on very well with. <laughs> <laughs> it could be a signal, yeah. If you get this in the post, he doesn't like you very much. Yeah. Um, if you were to describe Jeremy Corbyn uh, in one word, what would it be? Living in the past.
That's not one word. No, but that's... <laughs> oh, like a come away in such a short time. I'll give you four words. Living in the past, yeah. Well, thank God he's not living in the present because uh, he would be running the country if he wanted to be. Uh, but, Simon, thank you very much thank indeed. You. Simon Dunchuk there uh, with his memories uh, of the political world, the weird world of Jeremy Corbyn. Um, he is, in fact, many things, but he's not a Renaissance man. But he's got a book of poetry coming out. Um, that, of course, was my deep dive. It's been another interesting week in American politics. Now it's time for Trump's takedown. You are a rude, terrible person. You shouldn't be working for CNN. This is the legacy of Hillary Clinton. Death, destruction, terrorism, and weakness. I was going to say something Please, extremely rough to Hillary, to her family, and I said to myself, I can't do it. I just can't do it. It's just awfully good that someone with the temperament of Donald Trump is not in charge of the law in our country. Yeah. Because you'd be in jail. Secretary Clinton. She has tremendous hate in her heart. You are a rude, terrible person. You shouldn't be working for CNN. Have you ever wondered why this is still a thing? Well, so have I. Do you remember when they used to say, let the train take the strain? Do you remember when that was a thing? And when also, uh, the great thing about taking trains was you could get your work done, uh, you could meet people, uh, you could get a nice seat, you could have a lovely view. All of those great things that you used to get when trains worked properly. Well, they don't work properly anymore. If you go down the train station, there's a pretty good chance that everybody's on strike and there are no trains. If the train actually does turn up, there's a pretty good chance there's no driver to take it any further. And if you do finally get on it, there's a pretty good chance it'll be so rammed you won't get a seat, the heating will be on full in the middle of the summer, uh, and the cold weather, uh, it'll turn off altogether. It's a complete waste of time. My view is now this. Do away with trains. We don't need them anymore. Just get rid of them. Who cares? Why is it still a thing? Well, that's the first half of the show completed. I think it went pretty well. Coming up next, it's time after the break for Prime Minister for a week. Welcome back to the world according to Mike Graham. And it's a pretty big world, isn't it? So let's get on with the next bit of it, which is Prime Minister for a week. And I'm delighted to say that we've got two brilliant guests. Amy Ansel here, a former Apprentice star, of course, and now entrepreneur. And Benjamin Lochnane, political commentator. Welcome to both of you. Um, yeah. You might not want to remember that far back to when this trust was in charge, but, I mean, uh, it was a bit of a weird time. I'm sure you guys can do a lot better. Amy, tell us what your first move would be. Well, I can definitely do better, yes. Go on. So one of the first things I do, would I, I would implement 24-hour pharmacies yeah. in about every 10-mile radius. OK. And I think that would be super beneficial beneficial in so many ways. Mm. First of all, if you were one to get quite ill in the middle of the night, you don't have to go to A&E. Right. You can go to your local pharmacy and get very strong medication well, that's prescribed be, by your pharmacist. Yeah, because you can be very sure you wouldn't be able to get a doctor that summer night, would you? Correct. Not in this country. And so you don't have to wait at the A&E for 10 hours right. or so. And you help with the backlog mm. at A&E. So yes. it's super beneficial to both the patient and the hospital. Yes, because as far as I know, I think I only know of one pharmacy in London that's open 24 hours and it's in Streatham. Um, I think there, there used to be one in Piccadilly Circus but it got taken over by all the junkies, I think. So, Terrible. Um, so imagine that. One pharmacy in London for the entire night. Awful. 24 hours. Ridiculous. Awful. In New York, where I'm from originally, <clears throat> they're everywhere. Mm. And it's so beneficial. I made use of that many times. Yeah, well, New York's open 24 hours all the time. I, mean, I moved there a very long time ago when, when Britain was even more backward than it is now. Um, <laughs> and I couldn't believe it. Everything was open 24 hours. Everything. So when I moved here 15 years ago, I had to make a big adjustment. OK. Back well, that's then. not a very controversial suggestion. I think it's a good one. Thank Somebody you. might ask you how you're going to fund it, but that wouldn't be me. Benjamin, what's your first suggestion? <clears throat> well, I want to bring back trams. Right. So back you know, I read this earlier and I yeah. thought it said bring back trans. No, I no, no. So I didn't know where that had gone. Well, there's a lot of trams phobia going around <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> um, but no, we used to have the best tram system in the world. Yeah. But, you know, London was covered in trams. Yeah. And then you know, around the 50s, we just got rid of them for no yeah. reason. Just when I was a up. kid, they still had them. Yeah. And I wasn't in the 50s, it was in the 60s. But yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah they were, trams were great. And the places where trams are, 
Mm. Everybody loves the trams. Yeah, and it will do so much more than ULEZ for cleaning yeah. up London in terms of emissions because they run on electric rails and ULEZ, let's face it, doesn't actually stop pollution. It's a money-making exercise. Yes. So if, you, if Mayor Khan wants to clean up the city in terms of pollution and emissions, yeah. bring back the trams. I mean, the only uh, caveat I would issue to you is that I was in Edinburgh when they decided mm. they wanted to put trams into Edinburgh. And while people now like the trams in Edinburgh, they didn't manage to go where they said they were going to go. Yeah. And it cost about 25 times as much as they said it was going to cost. That, and, of yeah. course, it took longer as well. Well, that is the problem in this country. We're terrible at building infrastructure. Yeah. We did a lot more under the Victorians than we're doing now. And yeah. you look at HS2, it's an absolute it's just ridiculous. Joke, but when you go to European countries and you see yeah. places like Frankfurt, where they've mm. got trams, in Holland they've got them, it's a very nice way to get it's around. Fantastic. Mm. And you don't have to worry about parking your car. You mm. can genuinely actually use it. Yeah, well, they built them in Dublin about a few years ago. Mm. So they ripped up all their trams like we did yeah. in sort of the, I think, the late 40s, early yeah. 50s. But they rebuilt it. It's called the Lewis. It works perfectly, mm. very efficient. Interesting. OK, yeah. well, those are two very user-friendly suggestions to begin with. Um, let's see if you can get any more controversial. Amy, what's your next one? Well, it's not too controversial, but I'm a former theatre producer. Uh. And nowadays, when I go to theatre, people are scrolling on their I've phones. I've seen that. And, you know... If I pay fifty pounds, yeah. seventy-five pounds for a lovely evening at the theater, the guy next to me is scrolling yeah. the whole time. Yeah. I find it very disruptive yes. to myself, to the actors, mm. and then worse, phones often go off after the mm. interval yeah. when people come back and they mm. forget to turn them off right. and they ring. Yeah. So I think all phones should be banned in theaters and in cinemas. Yeah. Do you know? I think there have been in the past some either comedians, but also some some sort of pop stars who have said you have to put your phone into a secure location. Yeah. Partly because they don't want you filming what it is that they do yeah. as well. You know, some of these like very expensive, you know, comedy shows that go on. Yeah. So there's a way of doing it. You could just probably check it or something. Yeah, the, I, I don't know how we would implement it, mm. but I'm sure there would be a great way to do yeah. that. Mm. And uh, it would be so beneficial. I wonder if you couldn't just block them. Do you remember in the old days you used to be able to block mobiles in I hotel know. rooms so you I couldn't think actually you could use them? put something into yeah. the theatres. Absolutely to help right. That. Yes. Next one for you. <clears throat> Well, I want to outlaw veganism. Yeah, I like think, that. You know, it's like a that. disgraceful uh, plague yeah. that's exactly. spreading. And vegans. Yeah, and outlaw vegans. all of them. Yeah. Just say, uh, you're bad. You're, bad. you're out. You're bad. You want to go done. and find a little island somewhere yeah. to live on. You, you just time. go there and eat your vegan food. Live off plants yeah. for the rest of your life. Yeah. Uh, and, but it, the main thing isn't the fact that they're eating a terrible diet which makes them sickly and seems to have an effect on their brain where they want to go and glue themselves to the road yes. because they haven't had any meat. Um, the main thing is that they are vegangelicals. Yes, I like that. They never stop going on about being vegan. Yeah. You know, it's like the old joke, how do you know someone's yeah. a vegan? They'll tell They'll you. They'll tell you, yeah. yeah and they won't stop telling yes. you. So I just think, you know, if you want to be vegan in the privacy of your own home, go and do it. Yeah. No one will know. But if yeah. you're telling people, banned. So how would you ban them exactly? How would that work? Well, just, you know, ship them off as to Australia. As, you, as soon as you say you're a vegan, you're immediately yeah. arrested and taken Absolutely. off Absolutely. Sent to Australia. Yeah, excellent plan. He's getting a bit uh, I'm not outrageous sure how over there. how realistic that is, but well, anyway. We, well, we don't have to have realism here. I mean, we don't <laughs> forget, Liz Truss wasn't very realistic either. I mean, look what happened to her for yeah. economic policies. I mean, you think that was realistic? That was never going to happen. Um, have a look at your next one. What's yes, that? so my next one is no over-tooting your horns. Over-tooting? Oh, my what God. What about when you're in-tooting? <laughs> Funny. No. But no, when people drive, I mean, oftentimes it's, you know, the white van drivers, yes. but they literally be yeah. just two. Just lean on it. And yeah. ex well, because I think it's like bullying on the yeah. road. I yeah. think that it, it scares pedestrians. It's obviously very nerve wracking if you are the driver yeah. in a car that's being over tooted at. True. And I know exactly how I would implement it. Mm. So, you know, all the little ULEZ cameras, oh, yeah. you add okay. microphones to them. And if someone beeps for more than mm. three seconds, they get fined. And Don't three worry. seconds is a long time. Sadiq, Sadiq Khan's already beat, yes. beat you to this because he's actually going to put microphones on the cameras already. For what? So that they can uh, see if your engine makes too much noise. Oh, dear. So okay. if you start revving your Maserati, uh, you're going to get fined without even knowing it. They're going to wow. go click. It's horrendous, isn't it? But I think... You know, isn't it supposed to be against the law to, to honk your horn at certain times? It is, but it's not enforced. Yeah, I was doing some research on it last night. You're not supposed to beep your horn, I think, between 11.30 yeah. p.m. and 6 or 7 a.m., but no one follows that. I mean, you're from New York, though. I mean, I remember living in New York uh, a long time ago when it was dangerous to live there, and I lived, unfortunately, on 36th Street, which is the road into the Midtown Tunnel. Yeah. And at 6 o'clock at night, you, that was all, the only sound you could hear was... Yeah. It was literally constant. My recollection... That must be why you have this trauma. I... And my apartment in New York, I still have it, is on Broadway. Okay. On Broadway, sixth floor. Yeah. So, I mean, but from what I remember, it was like, beep. 
Steve. Yeah, but not when you're trying to get into the Midtown Tunnel. It was constant, seriously. I right? didn't live near the Midtown Tunnel, but no. I could tell you from my experience being a New Yorker born and bred, yeah. that is what I heard. A beep. I think I breathed in a lifetime's worth of particulates living there for about two years. I'm sorry you lived my in My windows that area. were black. No, it was great. I loved no, it. No, just because of the fumes. That's all. I don't care about the fumes. You should smoke 60 Marlboros a day. Didn't uh, make any difference to me. Okay. Uh, final one. Now, this one I think is going to be the winner. I think, you know, this is an obvious one. Bring back the death penalty. <laughs> It's about time. <laughs> it so, is. You look at Lucy Letby, for example. Yeah. In that, those sorts of cases, mm. you should have the option. I'm not saying, you know, for everyone or for petty crimes or whatever. Yeah. It's like littering, you know. Yes. Obviously, you wouldn't go to that level there. Veganism. Veganism. Well, yeah. I would for veganism, <laughs> maybe. But it's fine, because they're killing themselves with all that fake yeah, meat yeah. they're eating. exactly. But no, in terms of Lucy Letby, I mean, you've got a child-murdering mm. psychopath mm. who's killed, you know, like serial killer of children. Yeah. Just, you know... Why are you keeping them around? Absolutely. I know. I mean, it's obviously a big question in America in a lot of states have done away with the, the death penalty. Mm. They don't have it so much. Mm. But, you know, as I say, it's only Prime Minister for a week. You know, if it didn't work out well, you're out of a job and yeah. we'll bring somebody in and they'll just repeal it. You know, of course, yeah. like waiting yeah. for the Labour government to come in, isn't it? <laughs> uh, and get rid of all of the uh, really, really useful pieces of uh, legislation that the Tories have done over the last 12 years. <sighs> whatever they are. Uh, anyway, um, listen, both of you have done brilliantly. You, I'm afraid, I think are a bit too nice for this show, oh, Amy. My I mean, you've been very, very user-friendly, very consumer-friendly. I think you would make a great mayor of London because what you would do is actually help people. OK. Um, however, I think Benjamin would be the man uh, okay. to be Prime Minister for a week. I hope you don't think that's too sexist, but, you know, I'm going to no. give it to him. Um, because... I think uh, not only the death penalty, but the trams and the... V I mean, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a trifecta of delight <laughs> for me, I have to say. Anyway, thank you very much, both of you. Um, you. Amy, we'll see you soon. Benjamin, thank you very much indeed. That was Prime Minister for the Week. <laughs> it's been yet another terrible week for the President of the United States of America. Here he is this week with Biden's balls up. Well, folks, I eliminate one tax loophole out of a trillion six hundred billion worth, for, a, a trillion four hundred billion worth, out of a billion four hundred million. I should be a trillion four hundred. And now it's time to say sorry. It's my apology of the week. So. Kim Jong-un, a man who has been very badly maligned in the past. He is the supreme leader or the devoted leader or the beloved leader or something like that of North Korea, or with its proper title, the People's Republic of North Korea. Anyway, I've been a bit rude about him in the past. You know, his funny trousers that he wears. Uh, he's got a strange taste in food. Uh, apparently, he likes to eat a lot of lobsters. Uh, apparently, he really likes Rambo films as well. But, you know, I used to say in the past that this was a guy who could not be changed. You know, he didn't like looking after his own people. Some of them were said to be so poor that they were seen uh, eating parts of trees in order just to stay alive. But the trouble is, I think maybe I was a bit hard on him. And I was about to say, maybe it's time to welcome Kim Jong-un into the nuclear family uh, of countries that are, what you might say, on the right side of history. And I was about to do that, and then he suddenly announced he's going to go and have a summit meeting with Vladimir Putin. He's going to sell him some weapons. For heaven's sake, he's going to cause World War Three. Get lost, Kim Jong-un. I'm not sorry for you at all. Well, that was The World According to Mike Graham for this week. We'll see you next time. And coming up next on Talk TV, it's Kevin O'Sullivan.